don't know your RHR from your HRV, that's okay because today we're going to demystify every metric on your Garmin wristwatch. In this video, Tutu and I are going to break down the five heart rate metrics you should be looking at on your Garmin and two that most runners don't even know exist. Right, let's unlock the full potential of your Garmin device. Okay, Lindsay, I think let's start first with a very easy one. What about resting heart rate? Yeah, so tell us what Garmin does with resting heart rate. So these days, obviously because the watches now have the optical sensor, if you wear your watch all day, that's the tricky part is you kind of have to wear the watch all day. What the watch does is in the morning, it gives you your resting heart rate for the morning and also gives you a seven day rolling graph. So it shifts with the week, showing you where your resting heart rate is at each on each day. Okay, that's really good. So with Garmin, the beauty is that they are giving you your resting heart rate today, which is probably going to be a reading that they're taking in the early hours of the morning, just before you're waking up and giving you a rolling average. So it makes it super easy for you to compare that number to what has been. So it makes it easy for you to make decisions on whether you should be training hard, easy or not at all today. As a very good rule of thumb, if your resting heart rate is higher than four beats per minute than your normal seven day resting average, that probably means you shouldn't be pushing yourself hard in training. You can probably get out and do some training, but make sure that it's really easy zone two type of stuff. If you are eight plus beats above your normal resting heart rate, then you are really into a scenario where you're either overreaching or potentially getting sick. And so you want to take a day or two off of training so that you can see if that resting heart rate comes back to normal. And it's amazing how one simple management can tell you so much. Absolutely. And I think with that in mind, Tutu, if you don't have a Garmin or you've got a much simpler um, tracking tool or you're measuring your own resting heart rate when you wake up in the morning, I think the important thing is that you can't make decisions with heart rate in isolation. Got to know yourself. So therefore, you've got to take those readings every day so that you can make decisions when you take your rest, resting heart rate in the morning. Okay, and the next one is heart rate variability or HRV. So of course, a lot of watches now are measuring HRV and what Garmin does now is that they give you overnight HRV and then it gives you seven day average and then it gives you a four week picture um, and it gives you the optimum zone where you have got to be and the graph will show you where you sit in that zone so what can we do with that information let's take half a step back then to i think resting heart rate's easy everyone knows what that is what is your watch measuring when we talk about heart rate variability so the key thing with hrv is that your heart doesn't beat at a constant at a constant rate we know that the heart beats because it's an electrical signal there's going to be a little bit of of delay sometimes and some beats are going to be a bit faster so that variation that is picked up per heartbeat is what the watch is recording it plus a complex cardiograph but we won't get into the detail of it just know that your heartbeat is not constant every single time and what we actually want is the more variation you get the better it is and the less variation the worse and this has to do with cns stress essentially to do with your parasympathetic and symp sympathetic nervous systems and how those two interplay and a, and a greater variation is actually what you're looking for. Absolutely. So essentially, if you are in a position where you are under stress, then your nervous system is not going to be in balance because you're going to get a dominance from your sympathetic nervous system. And really, a high variability tells us that your autonomic and your sympathetic nervous system are, are working really well together and that the organism, you, are not under major stress. So again, Garmin really dumbs it down um, and it gives you a heart rate variability score rather than just giving you your heart rate variability and again it gives you a weekly average and your 41 day average so that you can track that over a long period of time and it makes it very easy then to make decisions due to what i like about heart rate variability if your watch is measuring it is that it's more sensitive than just resting heart rate. As you said, we are now tracking the actual differences in electric impulses between those heart, heart rates. And so you can have a very similar resting heart rate, but you are still under stress. And we can pick that up when that heart rate variability starts to decrease. 
But the one caveat here that I must mention is that these watches are using the optical sensor. And what is your feeling about, the, we often talk about accuracy, just measuring the beat itself is probably fine. But in terms of getting those, picking up that fine electrical um, impulse switch, um, do you think the sensor is doing a good enough job? Or can it do a good enough job that this actually becomes a reliable reading for us to use? In clinical settings, they have shown it to be fairly reliable. So we always have to take a step back and go, what's the difference between accuracy and reliability? We want both, obviously. <laughs> but if it's reliable, then at least you have a good sense that it's measuring similar things all the time and so it still allows you to then make decisions about whether you should be training hard today or whether you should be taking a rest day. So in a sense it's not the absolute number as long as it's consistent and you are getting a trend that and you can follow the trend. Correct and I think I think with all recovery metrics that's the important thing is having a trend allows you to know how you respond in certain situations and that's what helps you make the right decision at the right time. So the next metric that we can look at is something called stress. So the stress indicator on the watch, this uses continuous heart rate throughout the day and HRV. And then it gives you four hour, um, 24 hour and seven hour averages. And the idea here is that it's tracking your daily stress outside of activity. So it's measuring continuous heart rates, it's not resting heart rate now. Um, the watches now can measure continuous heart rate throughout the day and also then do HRV, they do those together and give you a stress score. The higher the value, the worse it is, obviously, and the lower it is, the better it is. So how can we use that in our approach to training? Again, in Tutu, these are wonderful metrics, and they do allow us to understand better what is happening and how our surroundings and the things that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis impact our training. So if I got a high stress score from my watch today, I probably wouldn't do much about it, but if my session didn't quite go according to plan, I would use it to help explain to me what is going on. And I would very seldom make adjustments to my training for short-term stress unless it's extreme. So uh, if you were to have a, an accident on the way to work or on the way to training, that would be an extreme stress. And, and besides your watch not needing to tell you <laughs> that would be the kind of thing that would horribly impact your training session and you'd probably skip training um, unless you're a bit of a lunatic um, <laughs> but you certainly wouldn't train hard but outside of that like short-term acute stress at work or, or with family I would probably carry on with my training plan as I had set it out however if you see a trend that something similar or something that's going on in your life is really spiking at specific points in the day. Yeah. I would A, adjust training because it is going, that chronic stress is going to impact your training and you at some point in time. Or at the very least, I would use that information to try and figure out when the best time of the day is for me to do hard workouts in particular. Because for easy runs, you're normally going to be fine with doing training, but it's when you want to do hard sessions that you're going to be very mindful of how you're, you're reacting to your surrounding and your lifestyle. Absolutely. And easy runs are going to help shed stress. Hard sessions will add to the stress. And so you really want to learn to differentiate between acute stress and ongoing stress and then make decisions about how that should be taken into account with your training. Okay, so the next metric to look at is something called body battery, which is literally a battery gauge for how you're feeling. And this one is quite interesting because what it does is it basically shows you that battery fills up and gets um, emptied as you do work or as you rest, and it doesn't reset overnight. So it's basically a cumulative measure of where you are in terms of energy levels. And it's using um, sleep quality. So when you wear your watch, um, it uses the movement and that sort of thing to pick up your sleep. And it's also using HRV and movement throughout the day um, to then figure out basically um, where you are. As I said, it's not a, it's not a, you don't get a seven day or that a long term tracking, but it is a continuous, continuous measure. And they also show you a four hour reading that shows your body battery and compares it to stress. So you can almost see how different points of stress are affecting your energy levels. Look, this is a really cool tool to use to actually identify when your best time of the day is for you to do your training sessions. So you can literally look and keep a record of how both sessions and your day is impacting on your body battery. So most of us live very structured 
lives yeah. okay so this is something that possibly not so useful to be told all the time that you're not ready to go in a training session but of course if you have flexibility in your life and you can make decisions about when the best time is for you to train if you train a lot on your own and you're not relying on other people fantastic tool to track over time and really learn when the best time is for you to get the most out of your body if you are very structured and you've got to train when you train i would use all the other metrics and i'd pretend i can't see this one <laughs> so let's say you've done all of this stuff now you've used all the different metrics whatever you've cho chosen resting heart rate hrv stress or body battery to then figure out when to train you've trained after your run, your watch now also gives you recovery indicators. It tells you, for example, it will say 24 hours or 36 hours, and this is actually time to the next hard session you can do. And this is using, of course, it uses the training itself. So it will obviously, during the activity, measure your heart rate, your pace, and that sort of thing, and figure out how hard you ran. And also then compares it with what your body battery was and what your stress level was to almost give you a cumulative idea of how much impact this session has had and how it affects your recovery, and it will tell you how long you should wait until the next um, hard session. So is this something that you think with the technology and the limitations and things, do you think this can be a useful and accurate way for you to plan around your sessions and know when to go hard? Because isn't that one of the most difficult things is like, when do you go hard next? Potentially, it sounds like a great metric to use. And we have discussed it in the past. And of course, I often get screenshots sent to me after someone's done an easy run and it tells them they must rest for four days so to be honest this is not one of my favorite metrics from Garmin I almost feel like it's the place where all the little inaccuracies come together I feel like with all the other variables the reliability of them makes them good tools to help guide you but here when they come together it's giving you information that's hard to believe. And I think you've said it a couple of times to me where it's told you you've got to rest, but you actually feel fantastic. So it's almost like there is maybe a little bit of error in each reading. And as you put them together, that just compounds what you're seeing. So you get this variability in useful information. And also we know just because you can measure something or compile something doesn't mean it gives you useful data out in the end. Absolutely. And it kind of just feels like it's overly conservative. Almost like a dumping ground for all of their data points. And Lindsay, here are two that maybe you didn't know about. So the first one is something called performance condition. I find this very, very interesting. When you go out for a run, you'll find in the first, say, 10 minutes of your watch, you'll get a little beep on your watch and you look up and it gives you a score. It might be like plus three today, minus two tomorrow. And I wondered what that was. And it's something which they call performance condition. So what it does is it uses your heart rate as you're running and then HRV in that first 10 minutes. So it takes continuous reading during that first 10 minutes and then compares it to your pace. And essentially because you've got historical data on your watch about your training, it can say, for example, if today you're running at a heart rate of whatever, um, in zone two, but you are running a lot slower than you were, it might see that as like, this is not a good thing. And then it can also look at HRV and say that if your HRV is indicative of the issues we described earlier, it gives you a a poor score and of course if the numbers are good it gives you a very good score now is this something that you think might be useful look i think this is the kind of tool that is really good as an affirmation tool so i think it's a way of figuring out am i feeling genuinely bad today or am i just needing a little bit of time to work, to warm up so if you aren't feeling great and your score comes in low then that's probably a good idea that today is a day that you should just keep running easy and, and have an, an easy session but if you're feeling really good and your body batteries uh, your performance indicator rather is like saying yeah maybe you're not on such a good day then i would play it by ear and go right i'm going to finish my warm-up and see how I actually physically feel once I start running hard. And then again, if I can, I'm not quite hitting my times, then you know, okay, today is not the day. I'm going to finish the session off nice and easy. But if you're feeling fantastic and your performance score comes up and says it's not right, I'd go, look, listen, let's just see how the session goes. And chances are, if you're feeling good at the start, you're going to feel good in the session. And also we know, for example, if you're doing marathon training, it's often those first 15 minutes are going to be hard regardless because actually we want you to carry a little bit of fatigue throughout your training plan. You're building resistance to fatigue for that last 10Ks in the marathon. 
and maybe it's often just about riding out the first 15 minutes and then easing into potentially yeah, a quality session. That is a really good point. I think in peak training, in those, in those 8 to 10 peak weeks, as we get into week 6, 7 and 8, there is going to be fatigue. And so sometimes we need to make the decision 15 to 20 minutes in and then go, right, today is not a day for me and so on. Yeah. And then there's another, it's, this is a very, very complicated metric called training effect. And the recovery one that we spoke about earlier shows you how the session will impact you in the days after. Training effect is them trying to measure how much fitness the session is going to contribute to you. And so what it does, it gives you a score of usually between zero and five. And the idea being that the higher that number, the greater the cost to the session. And the way they explain it is that it's actually more of a great tool to indicate when to progress your training. So you, you, you're you measuring adaptation to training. So let's say a beginner comes along and you schedule a one hour zone two run. In a one hour zone two run for someone who's never run before is actually going to be quite a hard session. And so that training effect might be a high number, a score of say 4.5. But I mean, you've just run Amsterdam Marathon recently, so you're quite fit. And for you, a one hour zone two run will be like a very small impact from an aerobic point of view. Um, and the beginner to you, as you train, that beginner will start to shift towards you. And then at some point, once they've adapted to the sessions and those scores aren't having as much of an impact, the training effect, as a coach, maybe you might want to then progress the sessions. And the watch is trying to pick up that, um, that nuance for you. And it does this both for aerobic um, training and it gives you an anaerobic training effect as well. I mean, this sounds like it's a very, very ambitious metric to me i think you explained how to use it perfectly i mean really it's giving you a score of what this session is relative to you and where your fitness is now the danger is that people often feel like they want to get the most out of their training and so they're chasing scores of four and five okay and that is not what we want you can use that metric to chase fours and fives in your high intensity sessions but chase ones and twos in your easy sessions and very importantly when your moderate duration sessions your one hour one hour 15 one and a half hour sessions are starting to come in at scores of one, two, and three, that's a good sign that you've adapted and you can progress and start increasing training volumes rather than chasing high numbers. And I think that's a key thing is that people often forget that like the easy runs aren't there to, you're not there to race those runs. You're not chasing, you know, at the end of a training plan, we don't say, man, that guy does some really good fast easy runs. And you actually do want those scores to be a little bit lower because you it's recovery in between sessions. And maybe as you say, the, the one hour 15, one hour 20 and the two hour runs, those maybe can be a little bit higher. But those easy runs, people need to remember that high scores aren't what you want it's time on feet and recovery for the next session knowing what these numbers are and how they work is one thing the problem is there are many external factors that can negatively impact the numbers that your watch is putting out watch this video to learn about the 10 things that can wreak havoc on your heart rate numbers but more importantly how to make adjustments on the fly so you don't make the wrong decisions during a run or a race